Welcome to day two of ERA 2020. This is the invited session number three on platforms and network effects. We have with us Julian Wright from National University of Singapore and Mark Ivaldi from the Toulouse School of Economics. The speakers have 40 minutes with five minutes of Q&A at the end. Please feel free to send questions through the Zoom Q&A feature and I'll let Julian start us off talking about data-enabled learning, network effects, and competitive advantage. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. Just gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, this is joint work with Andre Hedjou from Boston University. And I think we all know that, um, okay, there we go. I think we all know that um, big data has um, oh, become a big issue, right? And in IO, typically when we think about big data, we, we might have in mind um, targeted ads and privacy, or we might have in mind price discrimination. But there's another very important uh, aspect of big data in IO, which is the idea that um, you know, firms are learning from customer data and improving their products as a result. Um, and we're going to call that data enabled learning. And, you know, if you want to think of an example, think of you know, a familiar example for anyone who drives would be Google Maps, right? So when you use Google Maps, um, the more customers using it, the better traffic information Google has, the better predictions it can make about which route you should take, um, you know, to optimize. And, and that's going to lead more consumers to use Google Maps and so on. So it's a nice virtuous cycle. Now, there's a few underlying reasons why this has become so important. Um, obviously, the increased digitalization uh, and cloud-based products and services, cheaper storage of you know, big data, but most importantly, the use of machine learning, right? So we can get a lot of uh, predictions and insights from data these days. Now, the consequences of this change or this, these developments is that learning from customer data, what we call data-enabled learning, is becoming a key factor in the improvement of you know, products and consumers' willingness to pay for them. It also means that the learnings become much faster. So we often think about products where the, the learnings happen while consumers are still consuming the product, which is very different from the old type of you know, learning from customers that you know, maybe like a, you know, a car manufacturer might have done customer surveys and then in the next version of the car that they put out, they have some improvements based on what they learn. Here we're talking about, you know, because of the cloud-based nature of the products, the products continuously improving as the consumers consuming it. And in addition, uh, because the data is on each individual person that's using it, you know, you get a lot of uh, opportunities for customized product improvement or service improvements. Um, so these are things that weren't possible in you know, the old kind of uh, learning from customers. So here's some examples. Um, I've already mentioned Google Maps. You know, there's, there's a whole range of uh, uh, applications, obviously with recommendation systems where, you know, the, where the, the services are getting better as more consumers use them. Similarly with speech recognition um, or object rec recognition. For object recognition, things like autonomous vehicle systems, um, facial recognition, all these types of developments are leading to you know, a whole mass of new products coming out that utilize this data enabled learning. Um, you know, th at the bottom there, I've given examples across different sectors. Basically, you know, what we're seeing in the startups these days is this data enabled learning is, is prevalent across every sector. Um, and another example is in smart connected devices. So if you, you know, one reason I want to sort of so one difference between some of these uh, examples is if you think about Google Maps, the type of data enabled learning is largely across users. So, you know, the more other users there are, the better the predictions I get when I use Google Maps. And that's different from smart connected devices where, you know, you might have a smart thermostat, um, which is learning my individual preferences for what temperature settings I like, um, and then automatically giving those to me. And that's much more based on individual learning or personalized learning. 
right? So we're gonna distinguish between this sort of across user learning and this within user learning. Um, and an example of more like within user learning, the sort of another smart connected device is the bed, which is you know just showing you like a mundane product, how it can be, how data enabled learning can come in. And this eight sleep bed, which is available in the US, unfortunately not in Singapore yet, it automatically adjusts the temperature throughout the night. So it basically learns what is the temperature, the right temperature and the right temperature changes throughout the night to give you your optimal sleep. So it's monitoring your sleep and then it learns over time, which is the correct, you know, patterns of temperature to optimize your sleep. Um, and, and that's obviously much more personalized learning. Okay, so the research questions we wanna ask in this paper, uh, basically we wanna map out the competitive dynamics that arise under this data enabled learning. Think about the differences um, or similarities between the role of a cross user or within user learning and understand when does this data enabled learning create meaningful network effects. You know, network effects are gonna actually um, lead to coordination problems for consumers. Okay, so just a bit of uh, relationship with the previous literature. Um, there's two large literatures that this obviously links to. One is the learning by doing literature. Um, and in some sense, you know, if you think about learning by doing, it was really, uh, you know, as, as firms produce more product, they were able to bring down their costs, right? As they, as they produce more. The way that was modeled in practice was as firms sold more, they were able to bring down their costs. And this is obviously gonna be very similar to the idea that as you, get more customers, which means you sell more, you're increasing willingness to pay. So there's a mapping between these two. Um, but that's only true when there's no learning within consumption lifetime, um, and when there's no within user learning. So in basically, a, you know, one special case of our model, one I'm gonna focus quite a bit on, is actually quite similar to the um, learning by doing setting. However, even within that setting, um, what we do is a bit different, and at least in terms of the way we model and the issues we look at. So we have a vertical rather than a horizontal differentiation model. Uh, we get new results that we're not, you know, which we're, we're not in the existing literature. So we have a very general efficiency result, consumer surplus results, comparative statics, and so on. And probably more importantly, we have new issues that we look at. So obviously with learning by doing, no one was looking at data sharing, there wasn't this issue about across user versus within user, user learning that just doesn't arise with learning by doing. And there's no role of beliefs and network effects. So, you know, some of these issues are obviously new. The other, the other big literature that we relate to is the switching cost literature. Um, and that's, uh, if you think about the eight sleep bed example, you know, the more you use that bed, the higher the switching cost is switching to a new one that doesn't know your preferences, right? And so in our setting, you can think about um, the learning, at least the within user learning, is creating this endogenous switching cost that's increasing with the more, you know, the more you use the product. And at least as far as we know, there's no, uh, there's no model in switching cost literature where the switching costs increase with the usage of the product, even though that seems somewhat natural, even if you think about some of the traditional interpretations of switching costs in terms of learning how to use a product. So that's another contribution. There are more recent works which are more directly related to data enabled learning. Um, I don't have time to you know, go through the papers and talk about the specific differences, but the main difference is that we believe ours is the only one that has a fully dynamic model with you know, forward looking agents and where data learning accumulates. Okay, so let me start with the model. Um, and I'm gonna start by focusing on just a model with pure across user learning. So without any within user learning. Um, and spend quite a bit of time on that because it turns out the model with within user learning, um, many of the, you know, many of the well, results carry over. Um, and so this is sort of like a benchmark. Okay, so in the model, there's, a, there's two firms, there's an incumbent and an entrant. Um, you know, the only difference between these two firms is really the labels that we give them, but you can think of the incumbent as having more data 
and the entrant is having less or maybe no data, okay? Um, they have a marginal cost C and they compete in prices over infinitely many periods. So the firms are gonna be identical um, apart from, you know, so the learning aspect. And so you can, th I want you to think about this as sort of asymmetric Bertrand competition for the moment in every period, okay? Um, there's gonna be a common discount factor delta. And then there's a continuum, uh, large N equals one, measure one of identical consumers in each period. Okay, they decide which firm to buy from each period. They have unit demands. Uh, and either you can think of these as being a new set of consumers every period, or you can think of there being, you know, infinitely live consumers who can costlessly switch period by period. Either interpretation is actually fine. And, you know, actually could be a combination of the two. It makes no difference to the analysis. Okay, um, and then, Let's look at the utility. So the two firms, I and E, the utility offered by firm I is given by uh, this expression here. So SI is a standalone utility. So it's, it's exogenous and constant. Um, and that can differ across the two firms. So the incumbent or entrant, may, one of them may be better than the other in terms of standalone value. And then there's this learning function. So FI is the learning function. It can be different across the two firms. And it's increasing in the amount of data. So NI is the total number of, or sort of the measure of past consumers that firm I has served, which in the, turns out to be the number of past periods that I has won. And NI bar, upper bar, is a threshold level um, above which there's no further learning. So as firm I gets more and more customers, it's learning, okay, its value is increasing, but at some point, that the learning is exhausted and there's no further learning. And that's the threshold value. And that threshold value can be as high as you want. So it's in some sense, not very binding. Um, we normalize the case with no, no data, you get no value from learning. Um, and other than that, um, that FI is an increasing function, weekly increasing function. Other than that, there's no other assumptions on the FI learning function. So uh, this is an example of a, you know, one particular learning function that you could have. So the value that's created from learnings, increasing the amount of data that the firm has up to some threshold and then it's constant. It doesn't have to be strictly increasing. So maybe, you know, you need some training data before you're, before you're actually able to produce some results and improve the product. It can be convex or concave. It doesn't even have to be continuous. So it could jump up um, as long as it's weekly increasing. Okay, so, um, now we want to think about the value functions of the firm. So, you know, present discount of value of profit, uh, and the state's going to be N I and N E, which is the you know, so measure of past consumers that I has, and the measure of past consumers that E has. Or, I like to say that the amount of data that I has accumulated and the amount of data that E has accumulated. Um, so that's the state. And one way to think about solving this model is you realize that if you get to that threshold where both firms have reached the maximum amount of learning that they can achieve, then you basically just have a, a static game where you know, every period I and E are offering the same utility, which is their standalone plus the maximum you know, value from the learning and they compete. And we, you know, that's just gonna result in asymmetric Bertrand equilibrium every period, okay? So, E is gonna win every period if the difference between its standalone value is greater or equal to this difference between, you know, the I's learning versus E's learning at that threshold. And the value functions are then just the you know, present discount of value of, you know, the firm that wins is gonna capture the difference in the, the utilities offered and the losing firm's gonna get zero. Okay, so very simple. And then you can think about, well, what happens when say E is one period away from that threshold, but I is already at the threshold. And then obviously if E wins one more period, then it gets to the threshold and we know what its value function is. And if it doesn't win, so if I wins, then it's, it stays exactly as it was before. So nothing changes. And so you can see that since 
at that point, E is willing to subsidize the difference between the value if it wins versus the value it loses in the current period, then you can determine you know, what prices will be set and how much, what is the value uh, functions in this period one before the threshold. And then you can do two dimensional um, backwards induction and basically fill out the price paths and the value functions and determine the equilibrium. Okay, so that should give you an idea how we go about solving the model. So this is uh, the equilibrium characterization. So if you sort of start from I having NI past consumers and E having NE, and that's arbitrary in the you know, NE amounts, there's a unique Markov perfect equilibrium and it has the property that E wins this period and all future periods if and only if the difference between its standalone value and I standalone value is greater than or equal to this um, cutoff level delta. Okay, and otherwise I wins current period and all future periods. Okay, so it's a uh, delta function is uh, the summation. And if you think about, uh, if you divide three by one minus delta here, small delta, um, you should be able to see this is just the present discount of value of the utility that I would offer in every period going forward if it wins in every period, including you know, after it reaches, gets to the threshold, minus the utility that E would offer current period through to infinity you know, if it wins in every period. And of course, taking into account that it will eventually get to the threshold in that case. So the delta function sort of, it, well, it's proportional to the difference in the PDVs of the surplus created by I and E along the winning paths. And it's a measure of I's competitive advantage because obviously the higher is delta, the higher is the standalone value that E needs in order to win. And it's gonna be increasing in the amount of data that I has, and it's gonna be decreasing the amount of data that E has. Okay. Um, and in this equilibrium, notice that because this is a, what determines who wins, it could be that E wins even though E has a lot less data. And that's because maybe E has, you know, makes better use of the data, so it has a higher learning function. Or maybe even if it doesn't, it has more scope in the future to learn from data. So it has a, you know, its, it's learning function increases more than I's does or it, um, it lasts longer, right? Increases faster or it lasts longer. So it's not just the amount of data that determines who wins, but also the expected future paths of the learning from that data. Okay, the other thing to notice about this equilibrium is I didn't say anything about consumer coordination or beliefs or, you know, the, you know they don't have to determine, uh, there's no multiple equilibrium here. They don't have to think about what other consumers are doing. And that's because each consumer here is atomless and has no switching costs. So from the position of each consumer, they're just looking at how much surplus is offered today, both the utility and the, you know, the price that they face. And they know that their decision of which firm to choose today has no bearing on how much surplus will be offered tomorrow because they're atomless. And furthermore, they can costlessly switch. And therefore, they don't really have to worry, well, they don't have to worry at all about what other consumers are doing. They just pick the offer that's best for them in the current period. So even though they're forward-looking, fully rational consumers, in this pure cross user learning case, um, consumers could just as well be myopic and you get the same equilibrium, okay? That won't be true when we have within user learning. Okay, so um, this result, I'll just skip through quickly. So this just shows that, you know, all our results hold in the limit as we take those thresholds to infinity. So we, get, we can get nice limit results. So that means you could allow for unbounded learning functions. Um, if you want to. Okay, one more property of this equilibrium is that the subsidization. So even in the range where I is winning and E is losing, so in this range, so SE minus SI is less, less than the cutoff, E is offering a subsidy. And E offers a subsidy because if it was to win, then next period, it would become the winning firm and would get profit, right? 
get positive value. So even though it loses and in equilibrium it always loses, it's still along that losing path, it could be offering a subsidy. And likewise, of course, if I was losing in this range. And because of that, the winning firm may also be subsidizing. So, you know, I, I might win, but subsidize because it has to compete with E, which is subsidizing. Okay, so the subsidies in, in this model play, you know, the cross user learning model play an important part um, and drive this next result, which is that this unique Markov perfect equilibrium outcome that characterized turns out to be socially optimal always. Okay, so despite we have this virtuous cycle for the winner where, you know, the winner gets more data, they get better product, they make it makes it even easier for them to win, they extract more surplus, the outcome is efficient in the sense that the right firm wins in every period. Um, and sort of a simple intuition for that is, you know, this is, you could think of it as this is somewhat like an asymmetric virtual model, albeit in a dynamic, fully dynamic model. And so whichever firm creates higher, you know, utility, future utility along its respective winning path, you should think should win, right? Should be able to offer greater subsidy and win um, because it, the current utility plus subsidy this period. Turns out the logic is actually much more subtle than that because the amount that the winning firm is willing to subsidize is not the you know, future path of its utility that it creates, but instead it's the difference between the future present discount of value of profits it gets from winning versus losing in the current period. And the losing firm is also subsidizing around that threshold is around the cutoff is subsidizing and it's determined by the same thing, the difference in the future PDV of winning versus losing. And it's actually the difference between these two numbers or these two uh, measures that, that actually matters. And it turns out that when you difference this difference, you get back to this same um, logic as what determines uh, the, the firm that wins. So it's not an obvious result. And to show that it's not obvious, if we do the model with a finite number of periods instead of infinite number of periods, we can solve the same model with finite number of periods. We don't get that efficiency result. And in the finite period version of the model, um, if you take the limit as the number of periods goes to infinity, then we get back both the equilibrium and proposition one and the efficiency result here. So you only get this efficiency result in the infinite period version. Okay, another, another sort of implication of the equilibrium is that learning by the winning firm actually is bad for consumers. So although it's efficient, though the equilibrium is efficient, it's not necessarily good for consumers. And that's because in this model, um, consumers are left with the surplus of the losing firm, okay? And as the winning firm gets ahead, you know, further and further, the losing firm is becoming less and less competitive. And so its ability to offer a subsidy in the hope that it's gonna be able to win in the future diminishes, and so any subsidy uh, diminishes. And so whenever there's a subsidy that's offered, then you know, learning by the winning firm is actually gonna decrease that subsidy and make consumers worse off. So this would suggest that maybe there's a role for helping consumers um, you know, shift to the losing firm so that it can catch up so that it becomes a more competitive uh, discipline on the winning firm and makes them better off. So that suggests a policy like data sharing, which would be, you know, we require the winning firm to share its data with the losing firm. Uh, and that would help put more competitive pressure on, on the incumbent, right? Um, and that's certainly one aspect of, you know, from this previous result, it's one aspect that comes out of the model. But there's another aspect, another feature that, that's also present, which is if this data sharing policy is anticipated, so, you know, either at some time in the future or there's some probability that your data is going to get shared each period, and that's actually how we model it, some probability of data sharing, then it has a, causes a free riding effect, which is it reduces ease and center to offer that subsidy. When it's close, it was offering the subsidy, and if it 
has the prospect of getting ICE data and catching up without having to subsidize, it's going to reduce the subsidy. And so that sort of incentive effect or free riding effect can actually um, overwhelm the positive effect on increasing competitive pressure. And so what we find is if the intern is well behind, so it's not going to subsidize anyway, then yes, data sharing, once it comes in, it's going to increase competitive pressure, it's good for consumers, and there's no, there's no free riding effect. But if he's sufficiently close, but still losing, then the data sharing policy actually reduces e-subsidy and lowers the present discount of value of consumer surplus. So it's actually bad. Okay, so that's across user learning. I'm going to switch now to within user learning. So this is the case where, again, where you're learning um, from a user, specific users, you know, repeated experience of consuming a product. It's the same model set up in the sense for the same two firms competing over infinitely many periods. Continuum. Um, here we're going to focus obviously on the case where the consumers are the same consumer every period, so identical and infinitely lived consumers. Same learning function set up. Um, the only difference is the interpretation of data now, right? So data is not the number of other consumers or total number of consumers who've consumed the product, but it's the number of times a given consumer has purchased from firm I. Okay, so in the past. So that's, that determines the, the value that the firm can offer. And the other difference that we add, and if you think about these being customized products, specific to individuals, then it's fairly natural. We allow that firms can price discriminate based on the consumer's history, okay? And that's, that's a key simplification because otherwise you're gonna have, um, you know, potentially many different types of consumers at any given point in time with different histories facing the same price and you're gonna get mixed strategy equilibrium and, and it's gonna become a lot more complicated. So with those assumptions, um, we get actually, we find that the same uh, cutoff for determining which firm wins as the case with pure cross user learning. Okay, so this delta cutoff is exactly the same as it was in proposition one, even though the setting is, is quite different um, in the sense that it's, customer specific learning and this price discrimination here. And again, the equilibrium outcome is socially optimal. Actually, the logic for social optimality here is more straightforward than it was in the uh, across user learning case. So here, you know, um, consumers are forward looking and, and in this case, it does matter that they're forward looking because if they were, if they were just myopic, then they, they wouldn't take into account the fact that when they choose a firm, that firm's gonna get better, their product's gonna get better and better for them, right? So they, they have to take that into account when they're forward looking. And so they choose the firm um, which is gonna create the greatest PDV of learn, utility from learning. Um, and they can see through any subsidy, right? Like any subsidy a firm may offer to to entice them to buy now is going to be sort of paid back in the future by higher prices and that offsets. So in a way consumers see through all of that and they just think about which is offering the highest uh, utility, create the most utility through the learning and that's the one they're going to pick and that's of course the socially optimal one. And you know you can see that because if you take away pricing in this model, this is the case with within user learning, just put prices to zero, we get exactly the same threshold. And that's not the case in the pure cross user learning because there, if you take away pricing, you're not gonna get the efficient outcome. And furthermore, efficiency here holds even if you have a finite number of periods. So the logic for efficiency here is actually quite different as is solving the model. The model you know, requires, create, you, know, you have to solve for the consumer's value functions as well. So it's a, it's a different, it is a different model, different analysis um, and, and this efficiency holds for different reasons, but yet it's exactly the same result. Now, one interesting result we get is if we compare the results from across and within user learning. So you can ask the question, which type of learning is, leads to more intense competition? 
or which type of learning you know the firms get more extract more the winning firm extract more profit from and it turns out that despite you know whatever the learning function is um, the winning firm's profit is always lower um, with within user learning than it is with the cross user learning okay in other words within user learning is all, always more competitive situation than across user learning okay and the reason for this is these forward-looking consumers have to be compensated for not choosing a losing firm and making that losing firm a more competitive option for themselves next period. Okay, they, if they had chosen the losing firm, then you know, imagine they're indifferent and they, they choose the losing firm instead, that losing firm is gonna put more competitive constraint on the winning firm next period and they get to benefit from that directly, okay? Um, because it's the learning is specific, the learning that the losing firm gets is specific to them. And in order to go with the winning firm, the winning firm has to offer an even better deal, essentially more subsidy, if you like, to compensate them for that. And that means consumers are better off under within user learning than they were with across user learning. And it also means that data sharing is, um, there's, there's a wider parameter range where data sharing is bad for consumers because sort of without any data sharing, competition works actually better in this case. So there's less scope to, to, to need to offset that, um, well, to benefit the losing firm to provide a greater competitive constraint on the winning firm. There's less need for that and therefore data sharing, you know, it turns out, um, again, a very general result, um, this, unambiguously larger parameter range where data sharing is bad for consumers with within user learning. Okay, um, so finally, I wanna talk about network effects. So I haven't, up until now, no mention of network effects or coordination problems. Um, and that's, you know, with within user learning, that's because there's no learning across users, so obviously no network effects. With across user learning, remember the each consumer doesn't have to care what other consumers are doing because it has cost of switching and it's um, atomless. So when do network effects actually play a role? So I'm gonna talk about two distinct ways. So the first is uh, when, when we introduce the feature that I mentioned at the start when I was motivating a data enabled learning, which is you know a lot of the learning with digital products and cloud-based products is learning with it while consumers are still consuming the product. So if we combine pure cross user learning with uh, learning within the period, so in the, you know, when, when consumers are consuming a product in that period, um, the firm is improving that product in that period, or maybe more realistically or more naturally, um, you, buy, you buy a durable product um, like, um, you pay, pay an upfront price, a one-time purchase, and then you get to use it over many periods, right? And while you're using that product over many periods, the product is improving because of the learning, the cross-user learning. So, you know, imagine the, um, the case of the bed, if it was actually learning across users, then as more and more people purchased it, it got better for every individual, right? So then in, in these two cases, we're gonna get network effects. Okay, because I'm gonna care about when I choose which, which product I or E, I, I care about how many other users are gonna consume either within the same period or at least over the periods in which I'm consuming this product because it's gonna improve the quality of the product. And you know, in the first case, that's kind of immediate because it's in the period. In the second case, well, I could switch, but because you know, I've already paid this one time upfront purchase, if I switch, I have to buy again from the other firm. So that creates an endogenous switching cost due to the price. So in either case, we're gonna you know, have a coordination problem and network effects do matter. The most interesting case is we combine across user and within user learning. So we take the two models, we put them together, okay? Um, and then we get an endogenous switching cost, which comes from the within user learning. So, you know, the more I use the product, the better it gets. So that creates a switching cost, as I mentioned earlier. 
um, because I don't want to go back to having to start the learning again with a, with a different product. But at the same time, it's also getting better as more other people are using the product. So now I need to think about, well, the product I choose, which I know is going to get better as I use it more, should also be the one that everyone else is using because it's going to get better from other people using it. I don't want to get stuck on a product that's, yes, it's learning well for me, but it's not taking advantage of learning from other people. So you think about a natural example would be Google search, right? You choose between Google or Bing. Um, you know, if Google search is learning from your search patterns to give you better search results, um, and at the same time, it's also learning from other people's patterns, then, you know, if I'm thinking about, you know, starting from day one, thinking about which search engine to adopt, I'm going to think, well, if I choose Google and I think lots of other people are also going to be choosing Google, then I know it's going to, search is going to get better with other people using it. And the investment I make in, you know, using it and so it learns my patterns and gets better for me is not going to be, it's, it's going to be maximized. So it's going to be combined with that across user learning. Whereas if I use Bing, you know, maybe it'll learn my patterns well, but it's not going to benefit from as much cross user learning because not so many other people are going to use it. So if I have those expectations then everyone's going to coordinate on Google search. So we get this natural endogenous network effect that comes um, from the combination of these two types of learning. And obviously when we have that, then the consumer beliefs matter. And in particular, um, you know, the efficiency result is no longer going to hold in the sense that if we have beliefs that favor one of the firms, like the incumbent, then E is going to win less often than the efficient outcome. Okay. If, the other thing to mention is um, when, you know, in terms of the modeling here, um, these two models have quite similar to the pure across user learning model, it's quite easy to adapt those models to incorporate um, the extra component. Um, and so a lot of the sort of results carry over, if you like, from, from that earlier set of results. What, you know, the only really dif real difference is depending on the types of beliefs, if the beliefs favor the incumbent, then basically it's like the incumbent moves forward, in this case, moves forward one period. So it gets an advantage. If the beliefs favor the entrant, the entrant would move forward one period. If the beliefs were Pareto, um, then both, both firms would move forward one period. So in these cases, quite easy to adapt. In this case, it's, the analysis is more complicated and basically requires a completely new analysis to combine the two. Okay, so I think um, I'm on time, Leslie. Yeah, That's, for sure. I think we can go to like 23 past and there are a couple of questions yeah. too. Okay, so let me just conclude and I can get into some questions. So, um, you know, the obviously hopefully made the point that data-enabled learning is becoming more and more important um, and important to understand in terms of competitive dynamics for many new products and services. Uh, in the paper, we sort of look at what are the key determinants uh, of the outcomes with data enabled learning. Um, and one important lesson was, well, there's a difference in terms of competitiveness that arises between across user learning and within user learning. Um, with Within user learning be more, being more competitive. In the paper, we actually have quite a bit of analysis of comparative statics. So when does the a firm's competitive advantage, you know, what shifts that delta function um, obviously, it's learning curve matters, the position along a learning curve, the remaining learning potential, and we, we do a bunch of interesting parastatics. Uh, and then another important determinant um, that comes out of the model is the role of expectations. Um, and that arises when you have a cross user learning, either combined with this sort of product improvement during the consumption period, which we argue is a feature of uh, this data enabled learning. and, and digital products or cloud-based products, or if we just combine across user learning and within user learning together. So happy to take some questions. Super, Jillian, thank you very much. Super interesting. Uh, and I, I really like the distinction, and I think it's important, between the across versus uh, within user learning. And if you, if you take down your slides now, it'll bring you up uh, full screen. Just picking up on a question, from Masa Mamata, 
Um, could you uh, elaborate a little more on the role of the subsidies? So, for example, suppose firms could not set prices below zero, could you then have an incumbent that would always be higher quality forever? Uh, if the entrance product advantage is not large enough and the installed base of the incumbents is sufficiently high. Right. Um, so in the, in the pure cross user learning setting, so there the subsidies um, do play an important role in the sense that, and in here I mean subsidies pricing below costs, not necessarily negative, right? Um, the subsidies play an important role in allowing a firm that has better future you know, learning potential to win. So in that sense, I think, you know, it's exactly correct that if you take away the ability to price below cost, um, then you would take away the ability for an entrant in that, that kind of setting, which, you know, maybe it was behind in terms of data, but it has better learning potential to catch up to the incumbent and to win and, 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 um, and do better. So then you wouldn't get the efficient outcome, right? If you took away uh, the ability to price below cost uh, in the across user learning model. In the within user learning model, like I said, the pricing doesn't actually matter. You get the same outcome, and that's because consumers are forward looking, or they're forward looking in both cases, but in the within user learning, the forward looking aspect is important to them, and they take that into account, and therefore, um, you know, the subsidies don't actually matter there. And another question, um, can we interpret the across user data learning process as endogenous vertical differentiation between the two platforms? And can they coexist in the long run through this differentiation? Yeah, so that's a, definitely you can think of it like that. So it's um, with more data, they are obviously the products improving and the winning firm is products improving more and more. And so that creates this bigger and bigger gap. Yeah, so I, I, that's, that's correct. Um, but one thing to keep in mind in this model, this particular model, the winning firm, once it gets winning in equilibrium, it'll continue to win, right? So it's not that they'll, that, uh, they'll coexist in the sense of sharing the market. It is, a, it is a story where one firm dominates, winner takes all. And you're using the term winning, but like, can, are you staying away from the word tipping intentionally or you think it's not a good fit? Um, not a good fit for this model in the sense, like I said, there's always one firm that's gonna win in all periods in equal, along the equilibrium path. Now the losing firm may be trying to subsidize because it knows if somehow consumers would buy from it with that subsidy, then it could win in the future. But that's, you know, along the equilibrium path, there's only one firm that wins. So in that sense, tipping is, is uh, not really the right word. But yeah, with network effects, obviously, the, there is a role for beliefs here, right? And coordination and so on. Super. Uh, Paul Heidi has the question, if some consumers are myopic, would the logic of the within user learning model be affected? Yes, definitely. Um, good question. So if the users in the within user learning model were myopic, we would get exactly the result of the across user learning. So it turns out, we checked this, that um, if they're myopic, then it's no longer the case that within user learning is more competitive than across user learning. So that more competitiveness came from the fact that they were forward looking, remember that. So right. yeah, then we get, everything goes back. Of course, it's still the same uh, cutoff, but not only that, the same value functions, the same prices, the same outcomes for consumers as the across user learning case. Super, thank you very much, Julian. Really interesting paper and lovely thank presentation. You. Thank you for participating. I know it's yep. super late for you, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Let's uh, switch over to uh, Mark. Mark's going to talk to us about platform mergers, lessons from a case in the digital TV market. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Is it okay? Do you, Great, thank you. Yeah, is it all right? Okay, let me uh, set it up. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so 
so thank you for inviting me, uh, Lesti, to, to speak uh, this afternoon uh, uh, in this uh, uh, session, uh, in this uh, particular organization of the ERE conference. I would like also to, to thank uh, all the people at uh, Bologna University to, uh, try to make this uh, happening and, and possible. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to uh, to speak about um, platform merger uh, on a, on a, a specific case uh, on the digital uh, uh, TV market. It's a joint work uh, with uh, GK Zhang uh, with uh, uh, online uh, in Helsinki, I guess. Uh, so uh, I will first motivate uh, this research mainly. Uh, to, to contribute to the empirical analysis uh, of uh, uh, two-sided uh, digital market uh, by looking indeed at, uh, with a specific objectives to, to look at a merger decision in the digital TV market. And, and uh, the, I, I would like to, I, I will uh, explain the, the, the relation we see uh, in, in the, uh, why this market is interesting for, for digital market in general. And then I will uh, uh, develop our analysis by first presenting our data, uh, showing also why those data are uh, useful to, uh, to identify and uh, exhibit uh, uh, the, the type of relation we, uh, we want to, uh, to analyze. Uh, and then I will go to, uh, to the model, uh, to the presentation of the model, and I will discuss uh, the estimation result. Then I will be in a position to, uh, to, uh, uh, to evaluate uh, uh, the, the, the merger uh, before uh, providing uh, some, uh, some uh, concluding remarks. So in terms of the motivation, um, uh, so is to, to contribute to the empirical analysis of uh, two-sided digital market, uh, I will look uh, to uh, one of the most debated market, which is the market of online service providers. So let me start with that. I'm not going to make a model of that. I, I want just to, to, to uh, to motivate why, why we are interested in them by the, the TV market. So you are searching for information on the internet, you want to look uh, for a pair of shoes, uh, and so you have different ways to, uh, to learn about these shoes. You can, uh, you can use a search engine, can be Google, Bing, or, or, or Yahoo, or you can uh, look, uh, ask for, uh, on your, uh, with your friends or your followers on social uh, networks. Or you can uh, go to uh, some place where you then can buy uh, shoes like Amazon or eBay or, or, or there are other uh, 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 possible alternatives to, uh, to look for this information on the shoes. But what is interesting here is that uh, I have put uh, uh, different uh, uh, two-sided platform. Uh, all these uh, all, all these services uh, are on, on the one side available free of charge. Uh, and uh, and while I'm looking for for these shoes, I'm getting uh, some uh, some ties, uh, some ads, uh, which on the other side uh, generate uh, generate uh, revenues. Uh, so, uh, as you know, in this type of uh, of market. Uh, we know that there are uh, two, two, two types of uh, network effects. Uh, so uh, there are positive externalities of uh, user on advertiser in the sense that uh, given that you, are, uh, you can get the information for, uh, for free, uh, you are able to, uh, to have more users and, and that gives you uh, uh, a capacity and, uh, and more users, um, higher capacity to, to sell advertising. And, and so uh, the, uh, clearly the expansion of the, of the consumer base is the source of, uh, 
uh, the market for it. And, and, and if you are able in then to, to acquire a small competitor to increase uh, again this uh, consumer uh, bet, uh, of course that um, makes you in the in the, uh, uh, important uh, position on the on the market. And now on the other side, um, you can have uh, you you can have negativity of advertising on users. Well, sometimes users like uh, advertising, but uh, I mean, if you if you think about uh, some magazine, uh, a specific magazine, I don't know if you if you like cars and you look at uh, at cars, whether the information you get for advertising can also. Uh, be uh, valued by by user, but let's consider that you have negative externality, and in this case, uh, that, that creates that creates uh, an opportunity. Uh, I mean, that decreases the opportunity cost to to to, to switch between uh, between platform, and uh, that could be an incentive to to decrease uh, the quantity of advertising. So. Uh, so, uh, so, so the question of uh, looking at um, uh, the outcome of uh, this uh, different e effect in a, in, a, in a model is of course uh, quite complex, uh, and uh, the source is, uh, the source of uh, a lot of uh, economic debate and political uh, uh, debate. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, there are relatively few empirical analyses uh, along uh, along this line, uh, and um, uh, so so our object uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, looking at the um, at the digital TV market uh, is it, interesting because it has some aspect of. Uh, 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 some uh, similarity with uh, the market of uh, online service provider in the sense that uh, when you're watching a TV, uh, you're watching uh, your, your show for, for free and then you receive flows of ads. And on the other side, uh, this, uh, this flow of ads generates uh, so we are. Uh, in a very similar situation, and so what we can learn from uh, this market uh, could be uh, maybe uh, interesting to to to, to learn uh, uh, and to know uh, at least to to uh, maybe to uh, design some policy uh, for uh, for the online service market um, or, or for other type of uh, digital market. So the, our objective here is to, to contribute uh, to, uh, to this analysis, also by uh, looking uh, specifically uh, to a major uh, um, decision in the digital uh, uh, TV, uh, TV market. Uh, and because of uh, this merger decision, that we have uh, we have been able to uh, to look at uh, at this market, uh, given that uh, there are relatively it's relatively easy to get the So the decision uh, that we are uh, going to discuss uh, here uh, is um, uh, is a decision by the French authority. Uh, it has uh, two parts uh, of this decision. Uh, the French authority has approved the acquisition of uh, two uh, channel, two uh, small channel, by a big ch channel. But uh, it, uh, the, the, the authority imposed a, a remedy that to, to keep. Uh, separated the advertising sales house of uh, of the, uh, uh, this channel. The, the advertising sales house are the part of the of uh, uh, the TV channel that are in charge to uh, to sell um, uh, to 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 uh, to sell uh, uh, a spot uh, a t um, advertising uh, uh, spot. Um, so. Um, uh, and so the, the idea was to uh, to keep uh, the uh, this advertising sales house of the free uh, channel uh, separate. The, the rationale for the for the 
uh, for this authority uh, for this decision of the authority is the following uh, on the broadcasting side the authority considered that, uh, that there were uh, 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 relatively uh, high level of uh, cost efficiency in the sense that the, the, the TV channel could share the, the, the catalog of, uh, of TV broadcast and so they approve uh, on, on this side. On the advertising side, since the big channel was already uh, on a posi dominant position on the advertising uh, market, uh, the merger will have reinforced uh, this uh, position. And for this reason, uh, they have imposed uh, this uh, behavioral, uh, uh, behavioral remedy. So what is interesting here is that uh, in, the, in the decision of the authority is that the two sides, the two, the two sides are treated separately. Okay, and so the, the, the question is, uh, uh, is to know whether it was a good uh, decision, it, it was uh, coherent with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the theory, was coherent uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the data, uh, and uh, what conclusion we can draw from that. Okay, uh, so, um, uh, so le let me uh, first uh, uh, present uh, present uh, the, uh, the the data and some uh, um, reduced form uh, evidence. Uh, so uh, we have uh, monthly data uh, on the period 2008 uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2013. Uh, and note that the, the date of the merger. Uh, uh, um, we are going to, uh, to discuss was in uh, 2010. So in fact, uh, we are going to have data before and after, and uh, uh, we, we are going to, uh, to use the fact uh, that uh, we are observing uh, data um, uh, uh, after, uh, after 2010. So the data uh, bears on, uh, on, on 12 uh, bro uh, broadcast TV station, uh, which cover 75% uh, of the total uh, bro uh, broadcasting market. Uh, that's uh, the mean, in, uh, the, the, the one including pay TV, uh, but uh, they also represent 90% of the total advertising revenue which means that uh, the pay TV uh, is uh, relatively uh, as a very small part of the advertising um, uh, uh, market uh, in France. Uh, so uh, basically uh, the data that uh, uh, we have uh, to, to develop our structural analysis are, are, are here. We, we have the number, uh, the number of viewers, uh, uh, we have uh, information about the quantity of advertising uh, for, uh, for, each, uh, for each TV uh, channel uh, in each month. And, and we have also uh, data on uh, the advertising price per second uh, for, for, this, uh, for this channel. So a relatively uh, rich uh, data set although uh, we recognize that uh, it is aggregated in the sense that uh, we have uh, monthly data. Uh, moreover, uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, data on the broadcasting content. Uh, that is to say, uh, we, uh, we have been able to collect uh, from uh, from marketing uh, from a marketing uh, firm, a French marketing firm that uh, analyzes the the TV market, uh, we have been able to uh, to uh, to have information about uh, uh, the 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 number of hours of, uh, for example, um, uh, on uh, uh, broadcast. Uh, uh, on movie uh, by the different channel uh, in each month. So, so that's a very uh, useful information, of course, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, have a, a, an idea uh, or to identify uh, 
the, the quality of, of uh, the broadcasting uh, content uh, uh, of each, uh, of each uh, channel. Okay, uh, let me uh, speak uh, uh, on uh, the market structure. Um, uh, well, the, the TV station are uh, candidate uh, uh, to to be um, to be considered as a two two sided platform, uh, since they are providing uh, uh, two services, uh, uh, TV show. Uh, or a TV show uh, or, uh, to, to, to viewers and an advertising slot to, to uh, advertisers, okay? And so uh, one of uh, the, the objective of the empirical analysis uh, is going to, to be to identify if there are externalities uh, between the, this uh, two side and this uh, two uh, uh, two customers, viewers uh, of the two type of cost, uh, customer of a TV uh, channel, viewers and uh, uh, advertisers. Okay. It is important to, uh, to know about uh, the decision process uh, of uh, the TV channel. Uh, first, uh, they, they define the programming of the different uh, content, uh, sports, uh, uh, series, uh, news, uh, uh, and at which time, and uh, which quantity, uh, and uh, so that they are they are doing a month before uh, the, the broadcast. Uh, they are uh, a broadcast, so the the, the programming happen, uh, happens much before the broadcasting time. And on this basis, uh, the advertising sales house of the TV determines the supply of advertising slot and, and, and sell this uh, slot uh, to, uh, to the advertisers that want to, uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, advertising uh, uh, campaign. Uh, to, to, to determine this supply of advertising slot, uh, the advertising sales house uh, take into account the, uh, the sensitivity of viewers to advertising because they have uh, because they have um, uh, because they have information on uh, on how viewers react to advertising and of course on the quality of TV program since uh, the, the the programming is has been defined in house. Uh, the, the one important aspect also they have uh, to uh, uh, to act, to take into account uh, uh, some um, uh, some regulation imposed by uh, the French law. Yeah, you cannot have uh, you cannot have um, uh, depending on the type of uh, TV uh, the, the amount of advertising that you can broadcast in a day. And, and within some uh, period of the day, uh, have to be uh, have to be capped. Uh, okay. For for that reason, uh, we uh, consider that um, it is uh, fairly reasonable uh, to assume that uh, TV channel or advertising sales house are uh, uh, are behaving uh, as Corno and and the competition will be of uh, a Corno uh, Corno type. Uh, in terms of what we get, if you uh, with our data, if we just uh, run a OLS regression uh, on uh, on of the number of viewers on the amount of advertising, we uh, we are getting a positive. Uh, uh, positive uh, number, even if we uh, control for uh, different type of fixed effect, and it's only uh, if we account uh, for uh, for the endogeneity between advertising and viewers uh, by using uh, instrument and 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 the instruments that we have are uh, as you uh, could expect uh, our information on the on the broadcasting content. Then we are able to uh, to exhibit a negative relation uh, 
between uh, uh, advertising and, and TV viewership, which is what we can expect on average. Uh, um, uh, since uh, we can consider that uh, in general, uh, advertising is, uh, is uh, generally act uh, consider as a, as a, as a pollution by, by many, many people. On the other side, uh, we can uh, see that uh, there are positive relations between viewership in, uh, and advertising in the sense of the number of uh, advertisers, of uh, viewers, is uh, positively correlated with uh, uh, the, advertising, uh, the advertising price of uh, the different uh, channels that we have uh, for, for the uh, for the, uh, the different, uh, for the different uh, period. Uh, so the, the, it means that uh, uh, the, the, the model uh, is, uh, rela I mean, our data uh, are uh, adequate, uh, adequate for uh, um, uh, trying to identify the, the type of uh, network effect uh, that, that, that we want to, uh, to, to discuss. Okay, so uh, let's move now uh, to, uh, to, to, to the model and the estimation uh, uh, results. Uh, the, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the model, uh, we, will, we have two demand models, one for viewers and one for adver uh, advertisers. So let me first speak about uh, the viewers' demand. It's a very uh, uh, standard, uh, standard uh, nested logic model. Uh, we consider uh, there are uh, three types of uh, TV, uh, the incumbent TV channel, the intran TV channel, and the outside TV channel. The, uh, the latter are mainly uh, pay TV. Why we are making the difference between incumbent and intran is because uh, uh, the income uh, uh, are uh, the TVs that, that existed before uh, the advent of uh, the digital technology and the intrant, uh, by definition, uh, enter the market uh, with the digital market. Uh, uh, the, the digital market. So they are different in terms of uh, the uh, brand awareness since the incumbent are, uh, I mean, historic and, and so are known by um, many, uh, by more, pe more people. I mean, uh, um, and uh, the other things is, uh, 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 although they are, all, all the TV channels are uh, in general, uh, general purpose, uh, the, the intrant are uh, more focused, so uh, they are more focused on sport or more focused on, on, on news. Uh, and also there are different regulations uh, since, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the caps on uh, the quantity of uh, advertising is uh, tougher on incumbent TVs than on uh, intrant. Uh, the, the, the difference of regulation uh, was accepted to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to allow uh, the, the new entrant uh, to get a part of, of the advertising uh, market so that they could enter and have a, pro, a profitable uh, entry. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, a typical uh, uh, nested logic demand, uh, as you can see, the, the characteristic of uh, this demand uh, function is that there is, uh, no, there is no price eh? because you are watching for free and uh, the, only pr the, the price is, is in fact, uh, the, is in fact uh, the effect of advertising. Okay? And uh, so, uh, so uh, what uh, one of the uh, the outcome of, of the econometric analysis will be to, to know uh, whether alpha uh, is, going to, is going to be positive or negative. Uh, and uh, with negative uh, alpha, uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, this uh, will identify uh, the existence of uh, negative externality. 
uh, and uh, we have a bunch of uh, of, of variable uh, fixed effect uh, and characteristic of the content that uh, characterize uh, the the quality uh, of uh, the the quality of uh, the um, uh, of the channel. Okay, so uh, uh, it, it is important to, to see that uh, uh, so, so basically we have a relation uh, between the viewership of each uh, TV, YJT, uh, with the amount uh, of, uh, of advertising, AT, which is uh, uh, the, the, the vector of uh, the quantity of advertising in each uh, in each uh, um, uh, in, in each channel, and so so if you solve the uh, the system of demand, uh, you will get uh, uh, this uh, this relation. So uh, as you know, uh, uh, this type of uh, this type of demand model. Uh, uh, face uh, uh, an endogeneity uh, an endogeneity problem that we solve by using uh, BLP uh, uh, style uh, inst uh, instrumental variable so uh, based on uh, our monthly broadcasting hour of different content why is that because the TV as I said before the broadcast TV content is decided before the broadcasting time so then there is a correlation with the amount of advertising, but we expect that there are no correlation uh, with uh, the unobserved uh, uh, quality since we know the quality of, uh, of, of, the, of the different uh, uh, content. And uh, fortunately, that uh, gives a relatively good uh, estimation and relatively uh, reasonable uh, uh, parameters, uh, and we, we can uh, uh, see uh, we can uh, compute uh, the demand elasticity in terms of advertising. So, uh, as you can see, they, they are not, I would say, uh, yeah, elastic, but uh, significant uh, to, to the own elasticity to advertising are. Are, are significant and, uh, and relatively high. Well, what we can see is that the cross elasticity are, are small, which means probably that uh, uh, people are loyal to, to uh, the choice of TV, uh, TV that they are making and they are probably not uh, switching uh, quickly uh, to, to other, uh, to other uh, channels. Uh, then we go to uh, the advertiser demand, which is uh, maybe the, the original, the most important original part of uh, our model. Uh, the, the, the problem of is uh, that advertisers are uh, multi-homing because uh, when they decide uh, advertising campaign, they can put uh, advertising in uh, the uh, uh, ads for, for the same uh, products they want to pro promote. On, on, on different uh, advert, uh, on, on different TV, uh, and, and, and buy the slot uh, from from different uh, TV. So for this reason, we have considered that the uh, program of the, uh, of the advertiser is to minimize the cost of the uh, advertising campaign, uh, and, and so to uh, the objective is to minimize uh, the, the total cost. Uh, the, the cost of the, of the of the campaign to reach uh, uh, to reach a, a certain uh, level of audience and then to to uh, to approximate this cost function we use uh, a, a translog cost function where the the total cost is approximated by uh, the so this uh, uh, overall reach of audience and uh, the price uh, of uh, uh, the price of advertising in each uh, TV ch uh, uh, channel. Uh, as you know, uh, using the Shepard lemma, uh, then you, you can uh, compute uh, you can compute uh, the expenditure on, on, uh, on advertising on each uh, on each uh, uh, TV channel, and so by estimating uh, the uh, the, sh the 
the system of cost share equation, you can recover uh, most of the parameter of the cost uh, of the cost function. Uh, and so we are a, a full model uh, to address uh, the question of uh, multi-homing and at the same time to be able to analyze the substitutability or complementarity of uh, uh, advertising slot uh, of the different TV channel. Okay, uh, an important aspect also is that if you solve, uh, if you, uh, we can solve uh, the, uh, the cost share equation for the price and interpret for the price in terms of the quantity of advertising and uh, the level uh, of, uh, uh, of viewership. There is a problem of uh, uh, broadcasting, but I, I think that uh, given uh, the problem of uh, endogeneity, but it is not severe, it's not severe and uh, are, uh, it is easy to, uh, to, to solve. Uh, and you can see here uh, um, the, the uh, values for that we can get from the, the cost elasticity. What is interesting here is that uh, you have the uh, free channel TF1, NT1, and TMC that the free channel involved in the merger we are discussing. TF1 is uh, buying NT1 and TMC. And as you can see that uh, TMC and uh, NT1 are complement. Uh, are substitute, sorry, uh, but uh, uh, TF1 is uh, a complement of uh, NT1 and TMC, which means that uh, a priori uh, the merger should not be, uh, uh, should not have to, 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 uh, to many uh, uh, disadvantage uh, from the uh, from a consumer uh, point, uh, point of view, and we will use it uh, later. Okay, so now we are in position to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to evaluate uh, the, the merger. Uh, uh, so uh, first thing uh, we, uh, we uh, we can define the the profit function of each channel more, more precisely the advertising sales out. So uh, this house are uh, uh, choosing. Uh, the amount of uh, of advertising. So by uh, maximizing uh, the the profit, the price minus the marginal cost. So uh, if you uh, so the, the the question is, uh, I mean, the important point here is that the things is. Uh, the, the viewership is uh, depend on the quantity uh, depend on the quantity of advertising uh, by uh, the system of the demand of viewers and the price and the price uh, of advertising depend on the quantity of advertising and uh, the level of uh, uh, the total level of, of, of audience uh, and, and so uh, you have to take into account this relation. So when you write the first order condition, uh, you have uh, three, uh, three elements that appear. The effect of advertising on the price, the effect of viewership of the price, and the effect of uh, 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 advertising on the viewership. So. Uh, to, to solve uh, this equation is a little bit uh, uh, delicate, uh, and uh, uh, so so uh, so the idea is, is to have an algorithm to, to uh, that uh, you shoot the level of uh, advertising. Then you can compute using the demand model uh, the level of viewership. Uh, then using uh, uh, then using uh, uh, the uh, the cost uh, the system of cost share you can compute uh, the price and then you plug into the, the first condition until uh, and, and until you are uh, close uh, close to zero that depends of course the, of the level of uh, of quality uh, for each uh, t TV. That we are going to uh, uh, to to fix at the observed level. Uh, indeed, 
uh, as I told you, uh, we observe uh, data uh, after the merger, uh, and, and so uh, uh, we, we can look at the observed equilibrium. Using the model, we can estimate uh, uh, the quality, and uh, you can see that the quality of TF1 has decreased and the one of NT1 and TMC has increased because they have benefited, in fact, of the uh, catalog, uh, of the catalog, of the large catalog of movies and series of uh, TF1, and altogether, uh, the quality of the, of the group has increased. Uh, we, we can see also that, uh, uh, although, uh, so, uh, although the, the authority has accepted uh, this merger under uh, and under the um, uh, uh, the remedy, the behavioral medi remedy to keep separated the uh, uh, advertising sales house, you can see that uh, uh, even if it's uh, uh, small, an increase of price for TF1, but also a bigger uh, increase of price and quantity of uh, advertising of uh, the uh, the increase. And then uh, what we are doing, uh, what we, are, uh, we have done is uh, to compare uh, this observed equilibrium uh, to a simulated equilibrium where we consider that there is no externality, no negative externality of advertising on, on users. And then uh, uh, what, uh, uh, considering uh, the same level, the same le le uh, level of uh, broadcasting quality, the combination of the fact that there is an increase of quality and the fact that there are uh, no, uh, no uh, ex negative externality, uh, then the, res reply, uh, the, the reply of uh, uh, the advertising sales is uh, to decrease uh, the amount of advertising. Uh, the price being relatively uh, similar in, uh, in, uh, in both uh, cases. And then what we are doing is to uh, simulate what will have been uh, the situation if the, uh, uh, the, if the uh, authority will have accepted, in fact, the full merger, that is to say, will have accepted uh, to also the merger of the, of the advertising sales house, that is to say, they will have free uh, three different products, uh, TF1, NT1, and TMC interbroad broadcasting, but only one uh, uh, advertising sales house selling a, uh, 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 advertising slot for, uh, for the, the three of, of them. And uh, what we observe is that, uh, in fact, uh, the remedy uh, uh, has not been very effective. First of all, uh, if we look at uh, uh, the viewers, with and without remedy, uh, the, there is uh, the, 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 the surplus has decreased. By the way, in fact, uh, if we look only at the criteria of the of the consumer surplus of the viewer surplus, uh, the merger should have been uh, this, uh, 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 should have been blocked. Now you see that the consequence of the remedy has, has to be as uh, has been to increase the total cost of uh, advertising. Uh, so we, we don't know uh, their revenue. Uh, we, we cannot evaluate their profits. So, so we don't know wh what, is, uh, uh, what is the outcome in terms of profit, but we see that there is a big increase of, uh, uh, of cost. Uh, we see that in fact, um, uh, the, the remedy has not, uh, has not uh, 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 in, uh, prevented the TF1 to uh, uh, the, the group to to, uh, to increase. It is lower uh, with the remedies and without, but it's still uh, going. What is uh, very interesting is that uh, uh, the decision of the remedy has uh, increased a lot uh, the profit uh, of uh, the profit of other uh, TV uh, channels. So, uh, to conclude rapidly, uh, as I said, 
so on the basis of the consumer surplus of viewers, the merger should not have been approved. On the basis of total welfare, the remedy has no impact. And on a political basis, the decision uh, will depend uh, on the weight of the different uh, players. So, so the, the main lesson is that uh, ignoring the interaction, uh, ignoring uh, the, the, the in, in, ignoring uh, ignoring uh, the the interaction between the two sides of platform uh, can result in uh, unexpected outcome. And uh, we, we hope that uh, this lesson uh, will serve uh, in uh, the policy debate on the regulation of uh, digital markets. Thank you. Super, Mark, thank you very much. Um, super interesting. And I, I know um, that maybe you can turn your uh, video on now. It was, oh, great. Um, I, I know uh, there have been uh, large numbers of calls for economists to do more merger retrospectives, that we need more quality work to inform these merger decisions. And so it's, uh, it's really a valuable piece of work. So thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask um, for you, you had the price to the consumers, it was broadcast television. So your price to consumers, the monetary price was zero. And then the cost to the consumers was the irritation of being subjected to the advertisement. So did, did that make it harder or eat, like, was it useful to you um, to have to, the, at a zero price? And would it be, would the analysis be, would it adapt straightforwardly if you had prices to consumers for pay TV that has advertising plus a pay component? Oh, well, I, I I don't think that it, uh, it, it has made uh, our life uh, simpler. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, the, the thing is we did not have uh, uh, data uh, on, on the price and, uh, and uh, uh, precise data on the pay TV. Okay, so, uh, so we cannot, uh, it will have been nice also to, to uh, uh, to address uh, this, uh, this question. Although, as I said, uh, pay TV in, in, in France is very, very limited. I mean, uh, it's nothing to, uh, it's not comparable to, uh, to what we see in, uh, in the US, okay? Uh, so I think what is interesting here is, uh, is exactly what I tried to say uh, for the motivation, because it's really a, a market uh, uh, for, for this uh, digital TV, uh, where uh, the, the, the price is uh, it's a negative price in the sense that uh, uh, you bear the, uh, uh, the disadvantage of uh, receiving uh, advertising. Right. And for the future, for looking at these platform mergers, do you have a uh, um, is, is this telling us that we really are going to have to dig into very detailed analyses of both sides of the market and you can't just remedy one side of the market and expect that that's going to play out well in these platform settings? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, there is a big debate on uh, the example I used uh, on the online service uh, providers. I think that there is a big debate. I'm very surprised. But, I mean, but I think that uh, Greg said yesterday we have a problem of uh, access to, d to data. But uh, honestly, with the models that we have on TV market, if we had the, the data, uh, similar data for uh, for the uh, for the uh, um, uh, online service uh, uh, provider, we, we can we can do it. We, we we have the technology. Okay, so the, that's uh, the idea. And I'm surprised that uh, there are many many decisions, antitrust decisions that have, uh, are taken. And I, to my knowledge. Uh, this model has not been uh, uh, estimated. Uh, so maybe, we, uh, I mean, uh, we, we can discuss whether there is a, com a competition or not between Google and Amazon, but a priori, uh, that will be interesting to, uh, to know. Uh, 
and it seems so so what we have done and i think it's uh, our role of uh, uh, of researcher is to to provide a methodology to analyze this market i think that well i mean uh, i hope you you will read uh, the paper in detail uh, i mean it's it, it is working i mean uh, uh, having information on advertising on uh, uh, on uh, google uh, amazon and, and uh, have uh, the number of click uh, on, on them and, and and basically we have you have the same type of data that we are using for the for the tv market super so hopefully your paper is going to provide a framework from that data you get access to it so it's going to be really useful thank you very much and let's um have a nice virtual round of applause for both of our speakers I uh, appreciate uh, all the attendance and great talks. Thank you very much for contributing and we hope to see you at the conference tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.